Just an overview uh, of my presentation. I'll just quickly share with you, just remind you of the learning questions for the Practitioner Learning Group Initiative. Um, and then I'll share with you some key terms in terms of understanding social norms. Um, I'll give you a, a general um, kind of some uh, overview of the key norms in the economy that were identified by practitioner learning group members and um, give you some, some approaches for choosing which norms to focus on and then share, share with you some uh, of the most promising strategies for creating change in social norms. So, um, my, most of you have already been, uh, you know, seen this before. So I won't go into much detail except to say that uh, social norms in the economy is a key learning priority for Oxfam and outside of Oxfam more and more markets development practitioners are recognizing the need to address social norms in their work and so this has led to uh, an increased interest to learn together across organizations on this issue so um, we launched this practitioner learning group on social norms early uh, this year and we have this group consisted of 13 people from six organizations. Um, and from Oxfam, we had Pushpita, Saha, and Imogen Davies from Empower Youth for Work um, in the group, as well as two additional staff members from the We Care program. Um, you can see the, the organizations that participated in the group on the slide. Um, and the questions that we sought to answer were, what are social norms in the economy? How do we diagnose social norms in specific contexts? Or what strategies are effective at creating change at scale? And how do we measure change in social norms? Um, the webinar that we held in August of this year focused more on what are social norms and how do we diagnose them? That's when Imogen and Pushpita presented the results of the diagnostic um, that they uh, applied in Bangladesh, so or that they carried out in Bangladesh. So this webinar will focus more on the strategies for creating change, um, and and also how you focus, uh, how you identify which social norms to focus on. So, uh, but before we go into that, it's useful to just share with you some key terms in understanding social norms. So social norms are rules of behavior shared by members of a group or society held in place by empirical and normative expectations and often endorsed by social sanctions. So empirical expectations are people's beliefs about what others do and Normative expectations are people's beliefs about what others think uh, should be done. So social and, and social sanctions can be positive or negative responses or reactions by others to the behavior of an individual. So examples of positive sanctions might include smiling or patting on the shoulder or granting higher status in the community. And examples of negative sanctions might be scolding or gossiping or threats or physical aggression. So people's anticipation of how others will respond in case of compliance, positive sanctions or non-compliance, negative sanctions, is believed to affect their behavior. Um, the other, uh, you know, um, factor to, or component when we think about social norms is the reference groups. So um, reference groups are others whose behavior and opinions matter in shaping a person's normative beliefs. And lastly, uh, personal attitudes, people's individual preferences, independent of what others do or what is deemed to be appropriate. So that is what they would prefer to do if they could choose outside of a social context. Next. So um, the question is what what are social norms uh, you know uh, I'll, social norms within uh, women's economic empowerment in market systems development programs. 
So I'll just say, while a lot of attention has been paid to social norms in health and gender-based violence programming as an important factor that drives behavior, less attention has been paid to social norms and how they influence economic behavior in market systems development and we programs. So classical economic theory assumes that individuals or organizations make decisions based on rational self-interest. The reason that economic theorists have shown interest in social norms is due to the recognition that in specific dimensions of economic decision making, social norms can be more potent than monetized incentives or deterrence such as costs. So uh, meaning an opportunity for more profit may not incentivize someone to do something new if a norm implies there are negative consequences. So for, for example, a woman doing getting involved in, in uh, an occupation that is more male dominated if the sanction is to be is, is harassment then even if they're paid more they would prefer not to get, engage in that kind of activity so norms about the economy are the perceptions about what has value in the economy so what has value and therefore higher price or wages may not be linked to only cost of production but other intrinsic factors, extrinsic factors. So the perceptions that if you are working for no pay, then the work has no value in co value is, is common. Similarly, servicing a machine is perceived to require more skills and technical knowledge and therefore has more value than providing care services for people. So the, peop the belief that something is boring or work um, or dangerous work or exciting work can also have an impact on the economic value and wage it, and thus wages. So taking care of children may be perceived as tedious work requiring fewer skills and therefore is perceived to be less valuable. So social norms in the economy can contribute to gendered occupational segregation leading to the idea of men's jobs versus women's jobs women are often trapped in low levels of productivity and seniority or in professions that are considered suitable f for women. Um, and then um, in these uh, norms shape and distort markets, economic policy and economic decision making by influencing cost benefit analyses and investment decisions. So given the way social norms can shape uh, perceived economic value, it affects investment decisions. So, uh, you know, investment in roads uh, is seen as, as an investment while an investment in, in care uh, services or, or in water supply uh, or uh, uh, child care, those kinds of things are seen as consumption. The social norms have the value um, production and marketing activities over, so, so, you know, sorry, so the social norms that value production and marketing activities over subsistence, agriculture, or unpaid care work means that when governments are looking at where to invest to spur economic growth, they prioritize investments in productive activities rather than investing in, in alleviating the care burden or subsistence agriculture. So at the household and community level, people often focus on making labor more productive, so the investment on irrigation equipment is prioritized over laundry or the dishwasher. So the opportunity cost of women's time is almost zero, so investments are made into TV or radio or other things rather than things that decrease her burden. And, that, and that's at the household level. So just to give you um, a general sense of the key uh, social norms in the economy that the practitioner learning group um, identified, gendered segregation. So farming first is a man's job. Women are considered farmers' wives, not farmers. Um, Another is gendered occupational segregation, including men's crops versus women's crops. So men do the bookkeeping and women are secretaries, norms regarding management and control over income from cash crops. 
like cocoa, as well as other cash crops are considered men's crops. Third is a uh, care work is not considered work. Uh, it's uh, leisure. Um, it's petty and low skilled. Um, women shouldn't work outside the home. Men are good carers. Um, children and families suffer if a wife or mother works outside the home. This is something that the Bangladesh team identified. Um, and then working outside of the home is not safe for women. It's acceptable to harass women in public spaces. And, and lastly, well, two more, it's, it's difficult for women, for working women to get married. So women who work in markets or the field become shrewish or undesirable. And lastly, women do not have the same level of skills and competencies and confidence as men. Those are the kinds of, of norms that have come out of the PLG. So now I'd like to go into this, um, so, uh, just a, f a framework that um, can help in, in better understanding the strength of influence of those norms on behavior. So social norms are not static and they change as a result of various and overlapping factors over time. It's also important to understand that not all social norms have the same level of influence and strength. So if figure, the figure on this slide outlines how normative influence, uh, that means what others think should be done, can vary on a spectrum from strongest, stronger, weaker, and weakest. Um, so the uh, uh, Sigliani and Heisi who developed this, they say that the, the strength of a norm depends on four characteristics of the practice under normative influence, um, meaning the behavior that you're observing in, in your context. So these four characteristics are whether the practice is more or less detectable by others, like how visible it is, or whether it's in more in private spheres. Uh, second is whether the practice is under stronger or weaker sanctions. Uh, third is whether the practice is more interdependent or independent. Um, by this, uh, we mean um, whether, you know, what you do, uh, you do because there's this expectation that others will do something in return versus if you do something that has no impact, like it does, there's no uh, expectation from others in terms of what, what, will, what others need, need to do. So uh, and a good example of inter interdependent uh, behavior is when you drive, there are norms about driving. You have to drive on the right hand on the road in certain country, right side of the road in certain countries, other countries is left side of the road if you, and that's highly, interdependent. If you r drive in the wrong side, it's a big problem. Um, so that gives you an, uh, an, a sense of what we mean by interdependent and independent. And fourth, uh, the fourth uh, characteristic is uh, um, that, that uh, influences um, normative, you know, the, the behavior, uh, the, the, the strength of, of influence on the behavior that you're looking at is whether the practice is sustained directly by a norm or indirectly by a system of norms. Um, so according to where they fall on the spectrum, different practices would require different interventions. Uh, so varying from facilitating community dialogue that help people find beneficial ways to achieve the goal currently achieved by a harmful practice to something like a media campaign that strengthens a people's confidence to stand, stand up and speak against a harmful practice when they witness it. <laughs> so in this next slide, you can see um, it's, it's a, that, that spectrum that I just described. Um, depending on, you know, the norm, how strong it is, 
you, you'll be able to identify how strong the, the norm is based on these four uh, characteristics. So this analysis can help identify which norms are the best ones to target for uh, change by either prioritizing those that have the strongest influence or those that are most deeply held and can therefore yield the most impact in terms of creating change. So uh, the most promising approach uh, strategies that we are seeing, you can see up on the screen. Um, and I, they were in the uh, pre-reading uh, that we sent out last week. Um, so I won't go into them in detail. I just want to say that you know, we found that in order to achieve social norm change at scale, we need to work at household community level th through awareness raising and engaging positive role models to challenge, um, you know, the norms. Uh, like, uh, for example, men do care work, and the norm, and so challenge both empirical expectations, like um, men do care work, and normative expectations, highlighting the benefits of more equal distribu distribution of care work for more for not only women but children families and the wider community but at the same time we need to adopt innovative strategies for working at the public and institutional level through the media social marketing and private public sector advocacy to shift in institutional norms um, so so you you can see that if you go to the next uh, slide, that we have um, sorry that th we have the need to examine the interest. So what what we've realized is that we don't now that there's more interest in social norms. We know that we can't just, it's not the answer to all of our problems, that you know, social norms is one of the factors that is impacting the behaviors that we're trying to change. Um, and so we need uh, strategies that um, are looking at how the, how the social norms are interacting with these other factors. Um, and so, in the We Care program, for example, it's it's clear that um, they're looking, they're not just trying to change norms through awareness raising and communication campaigns, but they're also working on providing the infrastructure needed um, to to support the behavior change. So, if the behavior change is to increase, is to have a more equitable responsibility of care work in, in the household, then they've uh, provided, for example, um, or s supported investment in raised stoves so that you don't have to squat when you're cooking. And, and at the same time, they've, they've done these uh, We Care Champion uh, awareness raising uh, workshops um, to promote um, changes in, in the norm that men should not cook. Um, and so th what, what we found is that the combination of the stoves and the norms work has led to more men cooking uh, as part of that intervention. Um, the second piece that actually has been really, um, has come out of the Bangladesh uh, program is the use, um, the importance of using positive elements of existing cultural narratives to cultivate a new norm. So um, what we mean by this is that there may be certain entry points, um, so you can use like positive deviance. So there may be a norm, but there's some there's something uh, something someone who's doing or a group that's doing that's deviating from that norm, and you can use that as an entry point. And so in Bangladesh, for example, you have the men don't don't uh, cook, but 
young men before they get married do cook. And so they're looking at the opportunity that that positive deviant may uh, provide for creating change. Um, and then uh, the third um, kind of insight that I'd like to share about strategies here is the, how important it is to adopt um, collaborative approaches. So if we're working at, um, you know, in, the, in these integrated systemic strategies where we're working at multi-levels and multi-sectoral uh, with very many sectors, public and private, um, we need to ha work in, in collaboration or partnership with different kinds of organizations um, in order to have that integrated approach. And lastly, um, what we've also learned is that the strategies that aim to shift norms that underpin uh, gender-based violence and early marriage and delaying pregnancy need to be clear up front on how they will ultimately impact women's participation in the economy. Um, so like what's different you know, about your intervention within the Empower Youth for Work program your intervention on gender-based violence and early marriage, like what's different within Empower Youth for Work versus like if it was, you know, a typical uh, uh, program that just focused on gender-based violence, you know? Um, so it's, it's important to be clear up front on how your intervention is actually going to lead to in, uh, increasing a women's ability to participate in the economy. So that's it for, for me. Um, sorry, this has been very, uh, very quick, but um, there, there was a lot to share and, and I'm very uh, keen to hear some of your uh, questions and comments. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much, Claudia. Um, so we're going to go back to the <laughs> Google Doc now. So if you could reopen your Google Doc and then um, go down to um, the, the second section. Um, so uh, I'm actually going to ask you to fill in two sections, just in the interest of time, um, both relating to Claudia's presentation. Um, so the first under number two is um, any um, specific <laughs> questions of clarification, so anything that you didn't quite understand um, or you want um, Claudia to go into more detail on. Um, and then three is um, a more general question around what you found interesting about Claudia's presentation. So um, what caught your attention and why, anything you'd like to reflect on. Um, so that's more sort of your, your own reactions and thoughts about the presentation. Um, and the first one is um, more specific questions for Claudia and particularly around clarification. Um, so if you could start adding in your questions there, I'll just give um, one or two minutes um, to start getting some questions through. Okay, so um, I think people are still filling it in, but we have a couple of questions, um, so we'll start with those, uh, and please do carry on writing your questions um, while, uh, while Claudia is um, giving some of the first answers. Um, so, uh, and also if you could write your name um, when you write your questions so we know who the questions are coming from, um, that would also be helpful. So. Uh, Moving to the first question from Lean, um, 
she has a question about um, new insights which Oxfam gained around social norms um, from uh, exchange with other organisations um, through the PLG process. So there were six organisations including Oxfam in that process. So um, she'd like to know what um, what learning came up around social norms, um, especially around the different approaches um, that are used, or whether there are any there are any differences between what Oxfam's doing and other organisations, or whether they're the same. To Claudia, um, I'm going to pass over to you to answer that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lean, for that question. Uh, it's, so. The, uh, I'll answer first this, the second part of the question, which is, do different organizations use different approaches, or are we all doing the same? Um, I think that because the programs that were represented in the PLG were very different, you know, we had um, one program by the um, International Youth Foundation in Mexico that was uh, um, looking at uh, increasing uh, youth, particularly young girls, uh, participation in new kinds of um, uh, uh, sectors like high-tech sectors. Um, we had uh, Promundo that worked uh, mainly uh, on um, uh, in, uh, recognizing the value of care work. Um, uh, we had uh, care uh, that focused on um, promoting women in, in agricultural sectors. Um, so uh, we had a, a program by Swiss Contact in Kosovo that focused on promoting uh, women uh, uh, participation in, in new kinds of occupations, that mostly in, uh, more in urban setting. Uh, so so they, they were very different uh, contexts. Um, so I think the, the strategies uh, were different, but the, I think the there were principles that were common. Um, the common principles were the, the, the need to work at different levels. Like if, if we're really trying to create change at scale, we have to be working in an integrated way at different levels uh, in partnership with, um, with government, uh, private sector, and, uh, and civil society. Um, and and so and and taking into consideration the fact that social norms is not the only factor that influences behavior, and so we then uh, the recognition that we need to uh, better understand how social norms interact with other factors to create the changes that we seek. Thanks, Claudia. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next question from Lean, um, which I think I can give an answer to, and then I'll pass over to Claudia if she has anything to add. Um, so Lean is asking about um, whether we need to break um, specific social norms um, around gender roles in care work, SRHR, gender-based violence, etc., child marriage, whether we need to break that down further to achieve tangible changes. And I think yes, we definitely do. I think. Um, part of what Claudia said in her presentation was looking um, at what norms are specific to economic participation. So, for example, um, in the the work that's been done with the diagnostic tool, which is very much for that purpose to look at um, specific norms and that we want to focus in within these um, broad areas of norms, we've looked at things like um, community censure for um, men um, doing care work or what's perceived as feminine work. Um, Norms around mobility, um, norms around street harassment being acceptable for women who leave the house or do um, certain types of what's considered as masculine work. Um, so I think, yes, we, we definitely do want to break it down and we want to specifically look at how that relates to economic participation. And this is also something we're going to be talking about in the discussion a bit later down. Uh, Claudia, do you have anything to add or shall I move on to the next one? 
Okay, so um, uh, there's a question about strategies. Uh, so, um, ask, I'm not sure who this is from, but it says, um, when strategies can be implemented to measure the changes in social norms that inhibit the, um, which inhibit women from economic activities, and how those strategies can be useful to attain short-term valuable impacts. So I think Claudia has talked a bit about um, some of the strategies in her presentation, and there are also um, broader um, outlines of strategies in the um, the guide and the plan which she shared with us um, earlier this week or last week. Uh, so um, I don't know if you have anything to add there, Claudia, or if that's a, a broader discussion that we would need to take offline. Yeah, how can those strategies be useful to attain short-term valuable impacts? So this is a strategy for change, yeah. Um, yeah, I think the we yeah it's we need to it will depend on what the strategy that you use will depend on on which norms you're trying to change uh, so I, I think it is something we should take offline if you can write down your name um, whoever put this question and then we can have a, a more um, you know targeted discussion on what social norms you're trying to change and then discuss the, the kinds of strategies that could work for those. I think this is again something we're going to discuss um, a bit later on. We're going to look at what strategies yeah. people are already using, um, but then also what support um, you need from from Claudia, from the Knowledge Hub, and from myself. Um, and one of those things might be sort of how do we develop specific strategies based on the norms that we've identified. Um, so there's a question from Martha about. Um, whether there is experience or learning to share about some of the practical strategies to address gender-based violence and SRHR, like um, child and early marriage, um, denial of employment, um, or of women and girls outside the home. And then another question about strategies um, on um, what strategy choices are there specifically to address um, social norms in the economy, which ones are more effective and powerful? Uh, and that one is from Rory. Um, I don't know if, um, if it's a similar answer in terms of um, looking at strategies related to specific norms and whether that's, um, I don't know if there's a, a general answer that you can give to that or whether again it would be specifically related um, to the norms um, the different programs have identified. I think we need to, this is part of the discussion for, for the second part, yeah. We, we should include this in this discussion part of, of this webinar. These are great questions. Okay, thanks, Claudia. Uh, so, um, I think we've maybe come to the end of the questions. Um, does anyone have any more um, questions specifically around what you, reflections on what you found interesting in the presentation? or um, what caught your attention. I'll just give um, perhaps one more minute in case anyone has uh, any reflections that they want to add um, specifically under question three, which is around reflections on um, anything that you wanted to, to note that you found interesting from the presentation. I'm not sure anyone is in fact writing in the Google Docs, so I'll move on to um, the second part 
of um, the webinar, which is a broader discussion around um, four key areas which we asked you about in a survey. So we have some of your answers for each of the four areas. Uh, so thank you to um, everyone who um, sent in their responses. Um, we received surveys from Bangladesh, Ethiopia and Indonesia. Um, under each question I've left a space for Pakistan. So um, if you are able to, um, it would be good if you could um, fill this out as, as we're going along so that I'm able to draw on some of your answers as well. Um, so if you could move down um, to um, discussion part A, uh, and this relates to um, the question which Liam was asking around the types of social norms that program teams might be prioritising. Um, so for each country team they've provided um, the different areas of social norms that they want to focus on and then um, the social norms which they think that they want to prioritise. Uh, so to start off with, um, so something which has come up already in the discussion is um, whether um, there is a, we feel like there's a need for further identification and further diagnosis um, of the specific social norms that we want to focus on. Um, so for example, um, some of the answers in, um, from the country teams are um, a little bit broad, so some look at, um, for example, say, um, focusing on um, norms relating to early enforced marriage. Um, but it may be that um, you want to look very specifically around the type of norms that um, you want to focus on relating to those. Um, so, for example, um, it's not acceptable for um, a woman who is married um, to have a job, which is one of the um, norms which I think came out of um, some of the discussions that happened in the diagnostic tool um, focus group discussions in Bangladesh and Pakistan. Um, so I think it would be good to hear from each country team about um, what they've identified so far and um, whether they would, whether they feel like they need um, support or um, further um, identification or research or using the diagnostic tool um, to further identify what norms they want to look at and um, especially if they want to specifically identify which norms relate to economic participation. So um, I'm going to start with the Bangladesh team. Uh, I know that we have Pushpita um, online. I'm not sure if we have anyone else from the team, I'm just looking through the list. Um, but Pushpita, could I ask you to respond to that question around um, whether you feel like um, you want to do work around further identification of norms? Um, if you feel like, obviously, you've done, um, you piloted the diagnostic tool for, um, earlier this year, or whether you feel like um, you might have already done that, um, or if you think that there's further work to be done um, more broadly across um, the different contexts of the areas that you're working in. Uh, right, so uh, which section is it in? Because there are so many Pakistan sections, Bangladesh is actually. Um, this is in section A. Section A, right. We're looking at um, the types of social norms that program teams might be prioritizing. So if you could talk us through which um, norms you want to prioritize um, and if there's further identification that you need to do. Um, and if you could um, keep it brief, please. Um, because um, just in the interest right. of time. Uh, so, right, so basically uh, I have already mentioned, like it's there in the uh, Google Doc, the norms that we have identified. It's mostly around gender-based violence in the public space and also regarding the perception of uh, the value of men and women's work. Like, you know, changing how uh, the community as well as the family values men's work as well as as well as women's work. So these are the two issues that we'll be prioritizing: uh, a balance in the public place, that is, you know, while on the road or traveling or at workplace, and that would be done through uh, discussion with uh, SMEs uh, as well as uh, the community members and uh, policyholders and the uh, the. Uh, work regarding changing uh, the valuation or the perception of, of men's and women's work, how women, uh, how the community members as well as household members uh, value uh, both women and men's work will be done within uh, uh, families, like, uh, you know, uh, with husbands and wives and 
close family members and also for group discussion within communities. And uh, uh, Imogen, what was the second point? The second point um, was whether you feel like um, you need to do further work around identification of and the norms that you want to focus on, um, for example, by doing the diagnostic tool um, more broadly uh, in different areas or in different project areas and communities, or whether you feel like um, at the moment you have identified and are happy with the choice that you've made around um, which norms you want to work on and how they relate to economic participation. Uh, no, actually, we do have a plan of you know uh, scaling up the testing of the testing of the diagnostic tool. Although we, it's not going to be testing anymore, the implementation or the carrying out of the exercise of the diagnostic tool in our other three working areas, so that when we uh, consult with the policymakers, we can say that it's not you know we have tested in all the areas and not in any one particular area. So yes, we'll be testing it. However. Uh, uh, we don't expect it to generate uh, different results from the one that we have already got from the pilot testing. So uh, our focus area won't be changing, but just to be sure, we will test it in the remaining areas in the other three, in the other three districts. But not this year, but probably in year three and four. Thanks, Pushpita. Yeah, and I think that makes sense because um, we've done quite a lot of work together. Um, to um, interpret the findings from the diagnostic tool um, and to um, focus down on um, which norms specifically relate to economic participation. Uh, okay, I'm going to move on to the Ethiopia team now. Um, so um, I'm not sure who wants who is here from the Ethiopia team. I think Martha. Um, I don't know if anyone else is here. Um, by either Martha or someone else from um, the Ethiopia team. Um, so I, I know that you've done uh, a big piece of research um, looking at all three areas of, um, of social norms identified in the theory of change. Um, so I have the same question for you, um, and I noticed that you said that you want to um, prioritise unpaid care work, and I think um, that also makes sense in terms of um, the other the expertise that's um, in your country programming and having had the WeCare program um, for so many years in Ethiopia, um, there's a lot of uh, expertise and knowledge that you can draw on there within your within your country program. Um, but I also wanted to ask whether on the other norms um, there was more work that you wanted to do to identify how these specifically um, relate to economic participation. So for example you've written um, early um, enforced marriage um, but there, there isn't necessarily an identification of how that would relate to um, young people's economic participation. Um, there's some interesting um, comments around norms relating to gender-based violence and um, especially economic violence, um, which is really interesting. Um, but um, it would be interesting to hear from you whether um, you feel like there is a need for uh, further identification uh, and work to um, diagnose, uh, diagnose which, tool, um, sorry, which norms you would like to work on. Could I have someone from the Ethiopia team? I've also got um, Fekadu. Um, if someone could uh, help by responding to the question. Okay. Uh, I, can, I can share some pointers. Yeah, please do. Okay. Uh, uh, Marta, uh, so uh, as you can see from uh, our document, we uh, currently prioritize uh, unpaid care work, focus on unpaid care work because unpaid care work is uh, the first thing to deal with it because uh, based on our assessment findings, we may spend uh, uh, almost from 11 up to 12 hours of uh, care work. Uh, in both of the regions, so unless we uh, address such uh, uh, workload, we can't uh, access our beneficiary 70% of uh, girls and make them uh, empowered economically and socially. So the focus is uh, on peer care work, and uh, we identify some uh, norms under this uh, 
uh, under uh, GBV SRH in uh, MPK work. In under uh, SRH, for instance, uh, as you asked, child marriage uh, or forced marriage, uh, we have uh, practical examples of girls who, I mean, uh, married in their early uh, age and have a number of children uh, with, uh, I mean, uh, consecutive uh, years which doesn't give much time for the mother to be engaged in, a, in other uh, economic activities. So such kind of norms are identified uh, based on the assessment. Uh, currently, uh, we uh, receive the uh, report on the uh, on the assessment so we are uh, reviewing what are the norms identified and we are dealing with this so uh, now uh, we don't have any plan to further uh, diagnose the existing norms uh, our uh, current priority is to I mean design a strategy how to uh, deal with the uh, existing or with with the findings of uh, the norms uh, which uh, which came from both of the regions. Thanks a lot, Martha, and that's clear. And um, I know that the research that was done was quite extensive. Um, and um, yeah, I also look forward to reading that in more detail. I've seen um, some of the initial findings, but I think it'll be really interesting um, to read some of the deeper research which has which has gone into those. Um, so thanks for your contribution. Um, so I think from both um, the Ethiopia and Bangladesh team it's coming out that um, the identifi identification of norms um, has already taken place and it's more the strategies that we want to focus on now. Um, so I'll try and move quite quickly to um, the strategy section but first I'd just like to hear briefly from the Indonesia and Pakistan teams um, on whether um, and whether they feel like and they need to do further um, work around identification of norms and what um, what that um, further refining work might be. Um, I'm going to. I notice that the Pakistan team has written in their answers, which is really helpful. Thank you. Uh, I'm, so I'm going to call on. I think we have um, some hair online. Um, I'm not sure if if Sam is on as well, but um, I can see that Sahar is here. Um, so Sahar or someone else from the Pakistan team, um, Sahar I know that you've been specifically working on this um, on this project which is why I'm calling on you. Um, could you briefly outline um, sort of the, where the, the Pakistan team is in terms of identification and whether um, there's further work that you want to do around, um, around diagnosis? Yeah. He's very smart. So, uh, I think you've just unmuted yourself. Yeah, uh, hello. Hey, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, actually, I have uh, with me Saima. So, she'll uh, talk to the group about our Ah, uh, Great, thanks, Saima. Hello. Hi, Saima. <coughs> Can you hear us okay? Are you able to go ahead? Um, Saima and Sahar, I think you've just um, re-muted yourselves. Um, so we can't hear you if you're talking. Simon, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. You're quite quiet, so if you could talk a bit louder, and um, that would be helpful. Sure. Uh, so the norms identified using the social norms diagnostic tool um, include, but not limited to, uneven distribution of care in productive work. Uh, and the associated stigmas and negative pressures if some someone from the community tries to break those norms uh, then then the association of productive or uh, economic activities with male members of the family and the low acceptance of working women within the families and the communities harassment at the public spaces acceptance of 
domestic violence by both men and women and uh, we shared in the global learning event as well that women particularly elder women proved to be the promoters of domestic violence to some extent and this came up during the social norms diagnostic tool as well as during the baseline studies and the last part is the child or the uh, exchange marriages that are very common in the rural setup and uh, we have identified it as a limiting factor for the economic participation of particularly women in the sphere. Uh, so uh, the priority uh, for ourselves at the current moment would include the domestic violence, harassment at public uh, spaces and uneven distribution of care work responsibilities uh, for uh, the remaining part of the current year and the early next year. Uh, we somehow found out that the uh, uh, activities or the campaigns around SRHR uh, would be uh, better to uh, take off in the middle of next year. Uh, but at the moment, we'll be working around the uh, uh, favorable environment for the girls to uh, get out of their homes for uh, capacity building workshops as well as for other economic activities. So the domestic violence campaign will definitely be there along with uh, uh, the harassment and uh, uh, work responsibility sharing. Thank you so much. Um, and I know that um, we are planning to do some work together on um, further um, use of the diagnostic tool more broadly um, in the project areas. Um, so um, yeah, I'm already aware of that piece of work. Diagnostic tools uh, again in the field, but uh, I am looking forward to our work to refine that. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to quickly move on to um, Indonesia, um, just um, so that we can get onto a discussion around strategies, um, which I think has come out as um, a key area of interest for all of the country teams. Um, so thank you, Saima. Um, I'm now going to call on um, perhaps Rory. I think um, Rory is online. I saw that um, you typed a question earlier. Um, but if you um, similarly um, could uh, just outline where you are in terms of diagnosis of um, norms. And I know when we spoke in Bangkok, um, the Indonesia team said that perhaps they wanted to do some more work around this um, using the diagnostic tool, um, which they haven't yet used. Uh, so um, if you could uh, outline what your th current thinking is around the kind of work that you want to do uh, and, and um, whether you feel like there's more work that you want to do around um, diagnosis and, and prioritization of norms. Hello. Hi. Hello. We can hear you. Hi. Okay. <laughs> so, um, from Indonesia, I think in all AWA project locations, we work with communities with strong custom and social norms where gender issues are very serious issue that affects to limited access to women, to access a job opportunities, and also access to um, other opportunities. Um, that's why most of the young women, they are not allowed by the community, by these norms, to work at night. Sometimes when they have a work at the night, the community put them with the negative stereotype. Especially when they work in hotels, you know, uh, in some of uh, project areas, the woman who work in hotel is really not good um, impression to communities. Yeah, and we, we also have uh, many um, examples about this. And also most of the parents, I think in most communities in our project location, they, they really not trust with their uh, young woman to go far from their home. They prefer their uh, young woman to to stay or to living in their village, uh, doing uh, domestic work in the house, especially in the coastal areas, 
especially in the targeted youth, our uh, targeted youth, the uh, marginalized uh, youth groups. Um, yeah, for sure, uh, young women still have better opportunities to applying a job compared to young women. This is also we, we, we found during the mapping and assessment. Most of the young women in our target location, project location, especially the young women, they have limited uh, knowledge and skill. They have no opportunities to to go to a service provider to improve their knowledge and skill. That's why when they apply for a job, most of the the girls, the young women, they uh, didn't pass the examination. And most of the young men, they have uh, more opportunities to participate in the uh, technical training, uh, soft uh, skill training, technical skill training by the government or by the non-government organization. And also a uh, highly number of early marriages uh, in our uh, young women, uh, especially in the poor community, the poor household, uh, because the young women have limited access to go to a better education level. Mostly the community prefer to send their young men to go to a uh, better education level than the women. That's why most of the women in the village, the marginalized uh, young women, the poor household, the poor women, uh, they get early marriage because of this uh, situation. Thanks very much um, for outlining um, what's come up already from your from your scoping study. Um, and I think, um, well, you're scoping and mapping, which you've just discussed. Uh, mm. I think what's interesting is that there are a lot of commonalities coming out um, from each of the country teams and, and I know that something um, which you've all asked for is for space to have um, shared learning around this area and I think um, given uh, the commonalities uh, that would be a really useful exercise. I think I'll also follow up with the Indonesia team afterwards offline um, about um, specific support that might be needed in this area around conducting the um, diagnostic tool. Um, I'm going to move on now. Um, to the second section around strategies. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for your, your inputs into this first area. Uh, as I said before, I think this is um, the area around strategies has um, come up as um, something which um, country teams really want to focus on now, having um, done some of the identification work, um, but not necessarily knowing um, or uh, being able to uh, identify specific strategies which relate to the identified norms. Um, there were a number of questions which came up during the discussion which Claudia said that we would um, come back to um, during this discussion. So I'm actually going to hand over to her first uh, and then see if there are any um, specific questions for her afterwards. Uh, and I'd also encourage you to read through um, the strategies which other countries have put down um, under B. Um, so, and thank you for Pakistan for filling that in as well, um, so that you um, are able to get ideas from each other and we could perhaps cover questions um, about different country strategies as well afterwards. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Claudia to answer your questions from the discussion. Okay, great. Um, so there is a question. So Claudia's just having some problems okay. getting used to. Oh, I think it's working okay. now. It's working now, great. Okay. So uh, there was a question that, um, let's see which one. Martha asked, um, experience uh, learning to share about some yeah, practical strategies to address GBV, uh, SRH uh, related norms like child uh, early marriage, denial of employment for women and girls outside the home. Um, and so here I think it's worth mentioning uh, work that Promundo is doing uh, as part of a program called Prevention Plus um, that looks at uh, 
the acceptance and use of intimate partner violence, so working with men to prevent uh, partner violence, and uh, with both women and men to reduce the acceptance and normalization of violence in women's daily lives. Um, I, I, it, this project is being implemented in Indonesia, Pakistan, Rwanda, Uganda, and the Middle East, and North Africa. Uh, so I think it, it would be good to connect at least the colleagues from Indonesia and Pakistan to Prevention Plus if this is of interest. Um, what, what we found is that, um, let me see, hold on. For, yeah, it, there are various ways. So, if, if there's what, what's causing that, um, what are the harmful, you know, like uh, beliefs that are leading to GBV? In certain contexts, there are beliefs like jealousy is a sign of love, uh, control uh, is a sign of love or, or, or a desire to protect. Um, and while these things uh, are, you know, uh, are are good, but if they're taken to an extreme uh, and they and they lead to violence, that's when it's a problem. And so there, um, I I can connect you to people in Prevention Plus to hear more about how they've been shedding light on some of these beliefs and and kind of. Um, developing um, various um, communication uh, campaigns as well as like social experiments to get people to to um, be more um, what is it um, yeah, the, the word is uh, just um, aware of, of it uh, of these issues and uh, willing to stand up against them. Um, in terms of um, the low value and visibility, because you say uh, there's another question about what strategy choices, uh, what strategies can best uh, change social norms in the economy, which ones are most effective and powerful. In terms of valuing, like addressing the low value and visibility placed on unpaid care work and women's uh, time burden uh, or, or time poverty, um, what we found is uh, there you know, the need to increase the visibility and value of unpaid care work at, and that is done through community awareness uh, raising workshops um, but also by engaging um, sh shifting advertising uh, of, of uh, private sector companies and the um, and and working with the government to uh, develop public communication campaigns and in integrating uh, unpaid care work uh, issues into the curriculum with schools. This is something that the We Care program is doing and uh, subsidies uh, for time and labor saving equipment to reduce the drudgery of, of care work. Um, and, and finally, uh, lobbying the government to to invest in public services like water and electricity. So that, you know, co the combination or integration of these various approaches have been um, most effective. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much, Claudia. Um, that's really helpful. Now I wonder if also we could um, share that with participants afterwards, um, perhaps through the notes that Rose is doing in the Google Doc, or um, perhaps if we're able to put something together afterwards. Uh, I'm going to ask for just some quick reflections, because we have about 10 minutes left, and I'd also like to move on to um, identifying um, specific support. Um, so does anyone have any, um, any reflections on um, what Claudia just shared? Um, I'm thinking particularly the people who asked that question. Um, 
after listening to Claudia's presentation. I'm just looking back to see who it was who asked Rory. that. I think uh, Rory and Martha, um, <coughs> and I think um, another uh, unidentified person. Um, so if Rory or Martha or indeed anyone, um, anyone from from um, Pakistan or from Bangladesh, so um, Pashbita Khalid, um, Saima Sahar, um, I think we also have um, Shahzad. So if, if any of you have any um, initial reflections on that or um, whether there's something that you'd like to know more about uh, or any further support that you'd like, um, then we could also move into the next section around support and planning. Um, I'd be very interested to hear from you if you can unmute yourselves. Um, okay, um, so um, Claudia actually wants to add two things, um, so I'll, I'll let her do that and then I'm actually just going to call on each country team to outline um, where they would like support next um, based on um, the inputs that Claudia has given around strategy development, also based on the discussion we had earlier around diagnosis of social norms. Um, this will link with sort of where we're going to go next. Um, and um, what people's plans are for next steps. Um, but I'm first going to hand over to Claudia, and then I'll, I'll call on each country team for a final wrap-up of uh, next steps. Yeah, I think I, I just wanted to mention that I'll also share with you some research from Promundo that explains some, some of the um, uh, benefits uh, from a more equal distribution of responsibility of unpaid care work in households. Uh, benefits to, uh, for, for men and for couples and and families uh, so I mean, there, I'm sh you might have heard this already but you know like f uh, when when women feel that men are sh sharing the workload in the house uh, they uh, the, couples tend to have uh, better uh, sexual relations you know um, or they report having better sexual relations, or men, uh, when men uh, have good relationships with their, with their children, they report having, uh, um, being happier uh, in life in general. Um, so there, there are different, um, there's a lot of research that Promundo has done to kind of shed light on some of these benefits of, of uh, new ways of, uh, new, new types of beliefs and, and behaviors uh, that may be useful in your own communications campaigns. Um, and the other pieces uh, give you examples of the types of um, uh, mass communications uh, strategies used to um, shed light or to give more um, visibility to people who are breaking those norms to make it okay for others to also stand uh, up against an, um, harmful norms. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Claudia. Um, I'm, so I'm now going to call on each, um, each country team to any um, give any um, brief reflections on what Claudia said, but then um, predominantly to outline um, where um, support is needed and what your next steps will be. Um, oh. You can't hear me? Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. I'm glad you couldn't hear me, but I think it's working now. Um, so I'm going to um, call on uh, the Bangladesh team first. Um, um, perhaps it might make most sense if this is push Peter, because I know she's been doing most of the um, work here around social norms. Um, so if you could outline um, the support that you will need from, um, from myself and from Claudia and the Knowledge Hub um, around um, diagnosis, strategy, development, and um, what your next steps will be. Right. So. Uh the support that uh, we'll be requiring from you is uh, around the measurement of the changes that we'll be seeing. So we're expecting that uh, after we start implementing the diagnosis, uh, the strategies, some of the strategies that we have mentioned, and of course from our regular uh, 
activities under our so building block three uh, of our project, which deals with you know working with communities on GBV, SLHL, and all these issues. Uh, we would like to measure uh, the changes. Uh, we would like to see how far the changes have happened, or how concretely measure uh, some of the changes that we would be seeing in the community, and would like you know your guidance on doing that primarily. And uh, secondly, we'd also like your help in, you know, uh, uh, scale during the scale up of the tool in the other three districts. Uh, the pilot was done in a very uh, small number, uh, in a very uh, with a very small sample uh, group in a very small uh, location. But we would like to do it in a larger scale in the other three districts. So we'd also like to get your help in developing the methodologies for testing or uh, for uh, implementing the tool in our other working areas. Uh, regarding the next steps, uh, it's obviously the planning of when and how we are going to start implementing the tool. Uh, and as we have previously mentioned, uh, it's going to start from year three, but we are going to get into concrete planning of it uh, when in year three and how, so that we can also let you know, so that you can, you know. Uh, plan accordingly as well your time for us, uh, maybe around uh, February or March of next year. And we'll also be working on our, although it's not related to the tool itself, but we'll also start our work on rapid care analysis and vulnerability risk assessment of families from uh, this December. And we're hoping that the findings from the rapid care analysis study will complement our work or strategies that we have developed from the testing of the diagnostic tool. Thank you. Thanks, Prashvita. Um, that's really interesting to hear as well about um, some potential cross-fertilization between the rapid care analysis um, tool and the social knowledge diagnostic tool. Um, I think we're, yeah, we're aware of um, the support that you've asked for around the diagnostic tool. Um, and um, I also noted um, your questions around measurement, so perhaps that's something that needs some further thinking. <laughs> Um, so um, I'd like now to ask the um, Ethiopia team, um, so um, this could be Martha again or, um, or Fakadu or whoever would like to um, reflect on this. So if you could outline um, the support that you'd like, um, perhaps around strategy development, um, which I know is something which has come up for you, um, and um, what your next steps will be in the time frames for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, what uh, the supporters we need is that, as we uh, mentioned in our document, uh, uh, we uh, uh, need uh, I mean share uh, from the uh, good practice of the other countries their experience, and if, if uh, there is I mean uh, any document or cases that can uh, support us in uh, tackling such you know social, uh, social norms, and uh, I really appreciate what Claudia said that if it will be good if for us if we. Uh, uh, if you link us to this uh, the project or the program that was implemented in Indonesia and Pakistan, so we can learn a lot of things from them. Uh, uh, this is one thing. The other one thing, uh, we also need uh, the uh, change measurement of the uh, social norms. So. Uh, uh, if there is uh, also any any tool or any method that we can uh, use to change uh, this social norms is also one support. And uh, our next uh, step is that we will, uh, I mean, our uh, assessment finding will support us uh, in additional uh, identifying of our approaches, how to deal with this social norms. So we will uh, maybe have a new approach or we may be uh, well, uh, uh, strength is in our uh, current approach of dealing with social norms, uh, and also we will continue working uh, more with our uh, partners, the boys uh, or uh, the uh, pa uh, parents, household level, and as community level. Uh, so, in addition to these existing systems, we will have, I mean. Um, maybe additional approaches based on the uh, research findings. So this is what we have. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Martha, for that comprehensive overview. Um, 
yeah, I think, um, again, um, support around strategy development is coming up, which I think is something that Claudia and I will discuss after this webinar. And also, again, um, around measurement, um, which I think is something that we haven't looked at as much. Um, within the social norms diagnostic tool, there is an element of measurement. Um, but perhaps this is a, is a conversation that we would need to have um, with, um, with Lean uh, and Ronald and others um, to look at how we might, might do that. Uh, so thanks, thanks again, Martha. Um, I'm going to now move on to um, Pakistan. Um, so I, I imagine this might be Sahar, the Sahar and Saima um, dual microphone again. So um, Sahar and Saima, could I ask you to reflect on um, support needed um, around diagnosis and strategy development and um, timeline um, in terms of um, when you want to undertake it and when you will need the support? So how are you able to unmute? If not, um, I wonder if anyone else, oh no, I think she's just managed to unmute. I just saw it go green for a second and then it went red again. Um, Okay, um, so if Sahara isn't able to unmute, um, perhaps Shazad or someone else from the um, from the Pakistan team is able to contribute. Sure. Um, can you hear me clearly? Yeah, we can hear you, Saima. Thank you. Uh, so, in terms of the support required from your side, uh, one definitely would be for the further refinement of the tool, as I shared earlier uh, in the global learning event and uh, uh, today as well. Um, that we definitely would be uh, working on the document to make it a little more engaging, also a little more action oriented. So, the participants uh, uh, may develop the action plan or see their role in bringing up. Uh, the required uh, changes in the social norm. So uh, currently we feel the component is slightly weak and I definitely would suggest uh, to make some further refinements in that. Uh, the second support uh, or the discussion that I would like to have with the entire group uh, uh, would be around the frequency of uh, testing this tool. Being a diagnostic tool, I'm not very sure uh, uh, at how many places should we te test this tool to make uh, some claim about the existing social norms? Is it uh, like enough to test it at four or five places and then based on the identified norms we should then build upon the strategy or we need to like uh, exercise it in uh, more than these uh, uh, sites? So I would like to hear the feedback from the group uh, around the frequency of testing this tool as well. Thank you, Saima. Um, I'm not sure we have time now because I think that we're due to finish the 11, with the webinar at 11. Um, but I think that's something that we could um, discuss between ourselves, um, Claudia and I, and then also again perhaps with Lean um, to get her advice on um, what would make most sense um, and what would give us some meaningful um, uh, results and findings which could be applied to the whole program. Um, uh, sure. Because uh, uh, I was a little bit, little bit confused uh, regarding uh, the frequency and how then we are going to strategize the advocacy campaign. If based on the current diagnosis, we develop a, an advocacy campaign. Then what would be the use of the tool if implemented in future? So, uh, yeah, around whether we would want to do a sort of second round of implementation. Um, exactly. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. And again, I think that's something that we. Um, should discuss with Lean, um, which relates to our questions around measurement. Um, so I've, uh, I've noted that down as, um, as something we need to follow up with um, with Lean and Ronald. Um, so thank you for that. Um, thank you. Thank you for that comment, and we'll, we'll definitely go back to you on that. Um, I also wondered whether um, whether you wanted support around strategy development, or whether that will be through the action planning of the um, element of the diagnostic tool. The currently identified norms, uh, we are going to work with uh, an advocacy expert on that to build a, a proper campaign. Uh, 
but definitely would like to get your feedback on that as well. Okay, thank you, Soma. Um, and we're in discussions offline as well about the development of the diagnostic tool, um, so I'll follow up uh, on that again with you today. Um, thanks, Soma. So I'm now going to move on to the um, Indonesia team. Um, so um, Rory or, um, or whoever is able to answer this, um, would you be able to give feedback on um, what the next areas of support are that you need? Uh, around um, di further diagnosis or strategy development and the timeline for implementing that. Hello. Hi. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. For me to make changes to the social norms, especially in the community uh, at project site that still have uh, old habit, uh, gender bias it really uh, requires requires great great effort um, uh, exact strategy because as I know in Indonesia we we have a lot of uh, research a lot of project uh, both from government or uh, non-government organization dealing with these issues but some of the project they succeed to to achieve the result but most of the project they get failure uh, i think because sometimes uh, they use um, uh, strategy will not fit with the community profile you know we have a lot of uh, customs a lot of uh, tribes a lot of communities with different social norms uh, so, what we need, I think, um, we need to ensure we can develop better strategy to have this result. If we have references or best practice from other countries, we need to analyze it first. Uh, I'm afraid it will not fit with our project location because sometimes best practice from Indonesia also is not really fit with uh, the current location is really uh, different uh, uh, environment different tribes so I think what we need is to uh, develop a better strategy and I think it takes uh, time but we need to calculate how long we can achieve the result and also from several um, lesson learned, sometimes to change the social norms, uh, we can achieve through uh, combined or integrated with other project. I mean, uh, when we deliver the community um, development project, economic project, etc., at the same time, we can go through with the uh, this kind of uh, activities to change the social norms. Uh, I think that's all from me. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so I think what I'm hearing from you is um, that there needs to be a focus around, um, around strategy development and then also looking at um, how that might work in a way that's specific to the um, Indonesia project area context. Um, and I know that I spoke um, with um, some other team members um, when I was in Bangkok about um, the possibility of um, working together on the tool to do that. So um, that's something that I can also follow up with you offline on to see if that would be okay. um, the most helpful or whether we wanted to look at um, directly at strategy development together with Claudia. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, so I'm... I'm aware that we're eight minutes over, so I'm just going to wrap up quickly. Um, so, uh, 
I think the mo um, it's been really useful to talk. I think <laughs> I feel again like we haven't had enough time. There's never enough time to sort of um, discuss all the really interesting findings and developments um, that are happening uh, in each of the four countries. Um, but we've come up with some um, specific needs around support and um, and timelines for implementing those for each country. And um, so I think um, next steps are predominantly going to be around um, Claudia and I um, discussing and linking um, with Ronald on Lee and Lee. Uh, around how we can um, best um, meet um, the needs that have been identified. Um, I think that Ronald is now on leave until the new year um, and, um, and Claudia and I um, both have a lot of work on um, up until the end of the year um, so it may be that we discuss between ourselves um, and then um, get back to you in the new year. Um, apart from some specific work that I'm doing with the Pakistan team now, which um, we'd already planned um, before while we were in Bangkok. Um, so I think if you expect to hear from us um, in early January about how we'll take this forward, uh, then we can discuss um, together with um, our colleagues in The Hague um, to look um, best at who can provide the support um, and how we can deliver it um, to meet the, the country team needs. Uh, but um, I want to say thank you um, to everyone for joining and for um, sending in your surveys before, which have really helped to facilitate the thinking and the discussion. Um, and um, especially to um, Bashwita, Rory, uh, Martha and Saima um, for sharing um, your knowledge and thinking uh, around the, the social non um, development and diagnosis, which has happened at country level. And also, of course, um, to Claudia for her presentation earlier, which was really useful. Um, we will share around the presentation later um, later this week and um, we also have the Google Doc where um, Rose has been writing notes on what everyone's saying so we have a record of, of what's been decided um, and uh, some of the um, the discussions that happened so thanks to Rose as well. Um, so if you have any immediate questions um, please don't hesitate to get in touch um, with myself or Claudia. I think you all have our emails um, and some of you have our Skypes as well so um, you're welcome to get in touch with us in whichever way is most useful for you. Um, but thank you at, um, to everyone again um, for joining us. Um, I'm really excited about um, so the place that we've got to. Um, uh, compared to a few months ago and some of the really interesting findings that are coming out and um, I'm really excited about um, moving on to um, specifically looking at strategy developments um, over the over the coming months um, so thanks very much yeah, thank you. now I'm gonna close the webinar so uh, thanks <laughs>